Welcome to our viewers. Thank you for joining us for our fireside chat today discussing the economics of cloud and object storage. Joining us today is Eric Weaver. Welcome, Eric. Hi, thanks so much, Jennifer. This is Eric Weaver with the ETC. Um, I'm here to talk a little bit more about object storage uh, and the economics today. And I'm actually really excited about this topic because there's a lot of complexity in understanding how to define these things and what you're looking at in comparison. So in my prior role, I used to run global strategy at Western Digital. So we got to dig a lot into that because as the largest hard drive maker, um, we cared how the technology was used. So today with me is David. David, do you want to introduce yourself? Hey, Eric. Yeah, good to see you again. Uh, yeah, Eric, uh, David Phillips here from Cloudian. I'm principal architect for media and entertainment solutions at Cloudian. So help organizations that are looking to, you know, transition their workflows, um, you know, to private cloud object storage for large media libraries. Um, and how to integrate those with their existing uh, application stacks and uh, workflow process. Thanks, David. So let's go ahead and jump right into this. Um, how about we start by kind of reviewing our first webinar, which is kind of just the primary how to use uh, object storage and what the value is for media entertainment. Can you maybe just jump right into that? Yeah, I think it would be uh, um, helpful to kind of do a little quick recap um, where we kind of left off last time. Um, as we discussed in the last webinar, um, the concept of object storage as a storage technology, uh, you know, is distinguished by the, having essentially a cluster of uh, storage nodes that are, you know, using kind of a software defined storage layer, you know, can be run on commodity hardware uh, storage servers. So, you know, it provides a, the ability to kind of, you know, using this uh, clustered storage concept with a distributed database, um, you can really kind of have an abstraction layer between the storage interface, which in our, in the case of uh, Cloudian is a native S3 API, um, and of an abstraction layer that between the storage interface and the underlying storage subsystems. So, you know, you have an, an S3 uh, URL um, that, you know, when you put a global server load balancer behind that, uh, you really get a kind of a layer of separation. And this is what makes the uh, object storage platform so scalable is that you can add nodes to a single data center uh, to add both capacity and performance. And you can also add entire uh, additional clusters in a second data center uh, in order to scale both uh, you know, your total capacity of your storage domain, but also you know, geographically separate you know, your, you know, have, a, have a geographic distribution of your storage cluster. And this even includes the public cloud uh, through tiering policies, uh, different, you know, bucket by bucket storage tiering policies. Um, assets can be, you know, either provide at least one instance in the public cloud for disaster recovery, or it can, you know, be a part of part of an integrated workflow where, you know, assets are tiered to the public cloud and then cloud services pick them up and continue along the work workflow pipeline. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, you know, you've got users and applications and services that are all pointed at this, you know, storage domain URL, and then everything behind that is kind of, uh, you know, routed around to the nearest instance or routing around failure. Um, so this is what kind of distinguishes object storage from uh, traditional SAN and file storage. So wherever my assets live, uh, you know, if a user requests it, then the storage service just routes to the next available instance of that asset. Awesome. So thanks for that kind of summary there. Um, let's uh, go ahead and jump into kind of the economic benefits uh, as juxtaposed to uh, traditional SAN and NAS. So how is object storage uh, more cost efficient or what are the, the benefits here, especially as you dig into the differences between erasure coding and rate? Yeah, and I, th I think, you know, um, as we kind of touched on last time, you know, the 
traditional kind of price per terabyte um, for tier one, uh, you know, SAN and NAS storage um, is, you know, many factors greater than object storage. And a key part of the, um, the reason for that is that, you know, number one, it's a different profile of storage. It's tier one primary storage. It's meant to be, you know, lower latency, higher performance um, for transactional workflows, you know, like databases or, you know, you, where you're constantly editing um, and modifying files. Object storage is really designed for all of the, you know, all of the unstructured uh, data and media assets, kind of finished media assets. And it's really kind of more of a, you know, it's less of a transactional storage domain and more of a, you know, kind of read only immutable objects where you then can create versions. But for, as far as data protection is concerned, um, being able to utilize erasure coding, not just at the RAID level, but across the, all the nodes in the cluster, uh, really yields a you know a much greater level of storage efficiency compared to SAN and NAS storage, which you know are kind of used traditionally used like a, a RAID controller that stripes together a group of hard disk drives into a RAID set, and then you know you know you have a file system that potentially stripes those together and to make a, a larger storage volume. But there's real scalable limits with that, and then it's it also you know there's a, both an economic and scalability um, kind of liabilities to that. So I think that one thing people don't quite always note or understand is that means uh, that if you're on an object storage, you're gonna get more usable capacity out of the same amount of uh, drives. So if you have a petabyte or 10 petabytes, whatever your area is, that means that you're gonna be able to use a much higher amount of those drives uh, efficiently, as opposed to a situation in which in the striping array, you have to uh, then dedicate a lot more storage to make sure that uh, you're in line. Wouldn't you say something like that exactly? I, I don't know the number right offhand. I don't know if you have it. It looks like 75%. Well, it's in this example here, you know, is, is mm -hmm. using where you have 16 nodes. And again, these are independent storage server nodes in a larger cluster. Um, being able to, you know, utilize not only, you know, erasure coding schemes to, you know, spread the data fragments across the nodes in the cluster to provide that both data protection and data availability. Um, you also can utilize higher capacity drives. So like, you know, traditional SAN and NAS, uh, you know, RAID storage that uh, once you get up to that, Let's say, you know, if, if you wanted to deploy a nearline archive, you know, network attached uh, storage server for a nearline archive, you would want to use the highest capacity spinning disk drives that you, you, could, uh, you could, you know, deploy. Um, but once you get up to that eight terabyte level, you really start to hit the kind of limits of what the, uh, you know, the RAID controller can um, both, you know, spread across that, that that group of drives, but also in the case of a drive failure, what it can actually rebuild of that RAID set in order to maintain data integrity and data protection. Um, what was the yeah, term that's that you were using we, for that? A RAID wall. So at eight terabytes, you hit what's called a RAID wall. Um, and that means that when uh, that drive fails or if that drive fails, um, in rebuilding, you have a high potential of it failing in the rebuild, um, which is very concerning. So what this means for you long-term is your footprint and your um, different things like power and space in a data center. So with object storage, you can basically get as, um, as, as, as condensed as possible using the, the latest drives. Right now, I think we're somewhere around 16 to 18 terabytes by 2025. Um, Basically, the drives are looking to go up to 25 terabytes all the way, 25 to 30 terabytes per drive, which is a pretty big uh, jump. Um, and not being able to leverage that is, is actually really a big deal out there in the industry. So yeah. I, I think that's a, a really important thing to, to note. So um, from there, let's take a shift. Let's take a look a little bit more about the economics as juxtaposed to the cloud. Um, 
Me personally, um, I'm a big advocate of the cloud. I've always been a, a huge fan, but I also believe if you're creating a long-term strategy, you really need to look at what is important. You know, um, cloud doesn't necessarily just have to be public cloud, but you should have some aspect of that. So how about you jump in and talk a little bit about that, David? Yeah, you know, I mean, there's there's no doubt that there's, you know, there's many benefits um, to utilizing the public cloud, you know, for media uh, workflows. And, you know, there's been a, a steady adoption and kind of migration to kind of embrace these, you know, uh, cloud native, cloud centric uh, workflows. And I think a key part of that is that the, the consumption model that the public cloud service prov services provide, um, you know, th that OPEX, you know, uh, financial model is really attractive, especially to, you know, kind of short term kind of live event and project base based uh, usage where, you know, I'm going to spin up a lot of servers. So I'm going to spin up a lot of services and I'm going to, you know, um, I don't have, you know, I don't have to kind of allocate or figure out how much storage I need. It's I'm just going to, you know, it's a consumption based, uh, you know, model where I just use as much as I you know, need for my project. And then once my project's finished, I can kind of, you know, move it to, you know, like deep archive, you know, in the cloud, or I can bring it back on prem from all my finished assets and kind of spin everything down, um, you know, and so that have a kind of finite, you know, financial, um, you know, outlay. And, you know, I think, you know, and then long term, you know, like facilities kind of, they look at their on-prem data center uh, investment, and if they have aging data centers that they have to are up for refresh, they're certainly in a you know an attractive benefit to, hey, I don't have to uh, have this massive capital investment. I can you know just kind of migrate um, some you know portion of my data center footprint to the public cloud and save on that you know overhead costs of not only you know the the data center footprint, but also the engineering footprint headcount to, 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 you know, design, deploy, and maintain, you know, that data center. Um, and of course the, you know, a lot of attractive, you know, media services in the public cloud from transco, you know, cloud bursting transco jobs to AI machine learning. Um, there's a lot of, you know, kind of new sexy things with that, you know, operate very quickly and you don't have to uh, set them up and and administer them now with all that said you know there's no question that there's also downsides to um to a public cloud uh strategy um i think you know we talk to a lot of people who you know they're at this kind of crossroads of trying to figure out you know like what are the economics of doing a full public cloud adoption. Um, and, you know, there's all the public cloud services essentially publish their rate cards of, you know, how much they charge per gigabyte per month for storage. Um, and when you crunch those numbers for long-term usage, now, you know, this is content that you create, you own, you have the right on the rights to, and it has long-term value um, that you want to utilize it or monetize it down the road. Uh, you want to keep that for you know five years, ten years, fifteen, fifty years. Um, the costs are never going to go down. Um, they're only going to increase as you add more content to that to that storage repository. Um, so that's you know that's one factor. I think the the biggest question mark factor has been you know companies that adopt a cloud first strategy. Um, they kind of try to do the best modeling they can, but when it comes down to it, they can't really figure out and model what the actual real world bandwidth and egress charges are going to be for any given, for their data set. So, you know, for their, whatever their media library footprint is, um, they don't, you know, have a good sense on how much really is gonna charge to get access to it and, you know, download it. Um, I think there was even a, there was a, news article that went by recently where, uh, you know, again, it was in the science field, but, you know, NASA had had a contract with the public cloud storage service. Um, they were storing some 30 petabytes in the public cloud 
which they had budgeted, you know, they could budget for, what they could did not properly um, model and predict was their bandwidth and egress charges. And, you know, they had a contract for some $60 million a year, um, but what they didn't uh, account for and what an internal audit turned up was that it was going, there was going to be 30 million additional uh, charges, $30 million of additional charges per year just for the uh, for the egress charges as scientists download the data from the from the NASA data set. So it's just a you know a simple example of it's easy to kind of predict the you know the basics, but it's difficult to predict the uh, you know the real world uh, usage as you try to um, the very transition cost. from an on prim private cloud to a public cloud. So that's one thing that we saw a lot of. Um, I used to run a, a company that did uh, basically supercomputing resources on demand, which was kind of early days of cloud. And and what you really had to do is you had to look at um, ROI versus elasticity and understand where your peaks and your valleys were and plan. For right. It. So um, here it looks like you have a, kind of a model on that. Right. So, you know, the flat blue line here would represent, you know, but again, just kind of published rate card of how much per, how much, how many dollars per gigabyte uh, per month um, for a petabyte, you know? So um, if that comes to some $21,000, that's a set fee, you know, every month that you're paying. Um, the green line underneath that, the variability, you know, represents your, the peaks and valleys of your monthly bandwidth and egress charges, which uh, when you aggregate that on top of your, um, flat monthly fee for storing a petabyte, uh, you get this very, this, you know, you're kind of have this vulnerability and exposure to this, you know, this greater uh, ver variability, you know, which represents the, the red line represents the aggregate total of monthly charges, which, you know, the other thing that really, when we're talking about the economics of public cloud versus private cloud and long-term storage, you know, again, Every month you're paying, you know, the cumulative total over five years for, for using, and you know, and that's really what it comes down to. You're consuming or renting um, a petabyte of storage as a service uh, over a five-year period. Uh, you know, that can get up into the millions of dollars, right? So, um, depending on the cloud service and the current rates, you know, contrast that to you know a private object cloud where, you know, there's an initial capital investment and then you're amortizing that cost uh, over time. So, you know, your cost goes down, you have hard to re refreshes, but, you know, you you don't you have this like constant increase uh, over a period of time. You gave a wonderful example that I really enjoyed the other day when we were talking about cars, rental cars, Ubers versus leasing versus buying. Can you kind of give a summary of, of that idea? Yeah, I mean, you know, again, for, you know, as far as when we go back to the benefits of, you know, public cloud, um, if you are, you know, going on a trip and, you know, you need a car, you know, in that remote location, by all means, that it makes sense to rent a car rather than, you know, um, buy a car once you get there. Um, and then you turn it in at the airport when you leave, right? So it's not on, you know, like renting storage in the public cloud where there's uh, definitely cases where there's advantages to um, to essentially renting, you know, a car for a short period of time. Now, if you look at it over a long period of time, you know, I've got started a family, my kids have soccer practice, I commute to work every day, um, you know, it really doesn't make sense to kind of rent a car, you know, like uh, on a monthly basis um, when you're using it in, in that way. And you're also essentially going to be utilizing the car over, you know, five or 10 years over the life of the car. Yeah, so. I absolutely agree with that. I, I think there's certainly use cases where you're going to want to use an Uber. You're going to want to rent a car. And there's certainly cases where you're going to want to own um, 
own your own car or lease your own car for different reasons. So I think that's a great analogy. Um, so now that we've talked about sand NAS, we've talked about cloud, let's switch over to the TCO of tape. Um, yeah. Because that's a, think, another big issue. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, look, tape archives for media libraries is, um, you know, well-established, uh, tried and true, uh, infrastructure component for a lot of media organizations and it's you know been around for decades um and you know and that's primarily because it was you know for the longest time the most cost effective way to storage large you know media asset libraries uh over a long term you know the the five year the 10 year the 50 year periods where um you know you these are long-term assets that have long-term value so you know what I think is can be you know a little bit of a misconception about the economics of tape is that a lot of times people have the starting point of looking at how much does a single piece of uh, tape media cost you know and if you look at the price per gigabyte of a single piece piece of tape media it looks very attractive but what you really have to take into uh, account is all the different parts of a data infrastructure that allows you to deploy and utilize a tape library. And that typically starts, you know, you've got to have a tape library that holds, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of tape slots in order to keep your library essentially online and accessible. Um, then you've got to connect that via fiber channel fabric to a some sort of uh, middleware, let's call it, you know, a media asset management middleware piece that is some software platform that is running on server hardware that inventories all of the tapes and controls the tape robotics uh, whenever a user or application uh, issues an archive uh, uh, job or issues a, a restore request from the tape library. And another thing that you know people don't often kind of take into account the total economic uh, you know, footprint is you have to have some sort of uh, landing space for these tape archives that are um, assets that are coming back from the archive that are, they need some place to land. Um, and when you are staging archives for long-term uh, writing them to, to the tape library, you need to have some kind of um, scratch space as you stage these assets. And typically that's some sort of tier one NAS solution. So it's really like a disc to disc to tape uh, kind of strategy. So once you add all these pieces up, you know, it's not just the cost of the tape media, it's all the different parts uh, of the of the infrastructure that supports it. And not to mention that, you know, the full-time engineering headcounts it takes to kind of maintain and support this. Uh, you know, and it's because it's a mechanical system, you also have just a certain amount of uh, outage and downtime um, from mechanical failures and re mechanical repairs. Uh, you know, it's there's lots of moving parts. Yeah, and actually, it's a funny story I heard the other day of one of the key archivists who said, I'm one of the few people who can get on the lot. And it's because you've got to make sure these things stay up. Yeah, and exactly. You know, if if you if you have a you know a tape on the shelf, or you have a tape in your library that has um, has failed and is unreadable, and you have to replace it, then there's no uh, there's no doing that remotely. You literally have to be in the data center and kind of open up the cabinet and um, and interact with the mechanicals. Um, you know, and just you know, you also need to keep at least one copy, if not two copies. Uh, of all of your tape sets off site um, for you know disaster recovery purposes. So another so, thing that I don't think people talk a lot about yeah. is exactly this slide here, and that's that migration. I've never once seen um, an archivist say, "Boy, I can't wait for my next migration. That was a lot of fun." Yeah, it's um, yeah, it's 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 very um, you know. It's very painful, but it's also completely necessary when you're kind of managing a large, you know, uh, media library that's stored on on data tape sets, right? So, you know, the the inherent uh, nature of data tape is that it has, uh, you know, 
it has formats in the case of you know this picture LTO7 format you know holds it has a certain kind of uh, you know data specification of how all data sectors are packed onto the magnetic tape um, you know and the density of those of that packing data packing and then you know because data is growing exponentially uh, every year you need to pack more data onto that every single tape cartridge which leads to you know this phenomenon that every three to five years I have to migrate my entire data set to a new tape format because the current tape drives they read and write the current format and they read back to um, you know for for transition and you if you don't do the migration you put yourself in a vulnerable position of um, you know your tape drives out of warranty uh, end of life they fail you can't get them repaired if you buy a new tape drive you can't read back your you know three three generations back of your your existing tape library so it's it's an inherent uh, requirement of tape libraries and that's actually a really great document that's been produced on this called The Digital Dilemma. So if you ever look back, it's a little bit of an older document, but it was produced by Ampass. But if you want to read up, it's, it's a fantastically interesting problem. Yeah. So, look, I mean, you know, it's kind of in a nutshell, um, it's very easy to kind of just look at a piece of tape media and say, like, wow, that's got to be the least expensive way to – to store my data. Um, and, you know, it is a very, you know, cost effective way of storing your data. I, but when you kind of layer on all of the costs, both hard and soft costs um, on top of what it takes to actually, you know, archive, access, maintain, you know, that uh, tape archive, uh, it really starts to add up. And it's not it's not just the cost, but the operational complexity um, and this infrastructure complexity that's driven a lot of organizations to migrate and you know transition to object storage for their media archives. You know to create number one, I have an online active archive that's accessible you know via my network, um, and I can access I can administer uh, it remotely. You know. If I have failed drives, I have so much data protection built in that I, I don't have this urgency to get into the data center tomorrow morning to, to replace the drives. Engineers can come around quarterly and just, you know, in a, in a large yeah. cluster, just replace the failed drives that, uh, that need to be replaced. And the system takes care of, okay, I've got new replacement hardware. I'm going to, in the background, rebuild uh, these erasure code data sets. So, and, and I think on the opposite or slightly inverse side of that, um, monetization, you simply can't really monetize a tape library. And in this COVID era and this actually this new distributed era where there's all these online services, you want to be able to monetize in a very quick turnaround all of these different pieces of content you have in your archive because your archive is now a revenue center. So that's a important thing to also think about within this um, within these considerations that you're looking at um, one other thing that I do hear a lot of people you know you, you get into a lot of fine-grained detail of arguing about the cost efficiency here which you've begun to done a really good job of breaking down these costs um, but I, I think that this actually is a, a good case for cloud and deep archive. So if you were actually just concerned about losing your bits and having that copy, this actually is physically better to really look at a glacier, to look at a Google deep storage of sorts. Um, because economically speaking, you don't have all this headache and you still have that uh, level of uh, data protection that is really important. Um, yeah, so completely um, agree. Yeah, completely agree. And I think the other thing that people don't uh, take into account with a long-term tape archive is that you really don't know if your data is, in, you know, valid and integral um, until you read the data tape back out. So if it sits in the library for five years, ten years, well, five years, three to five years, and then you try to read it back out. Um, you know, 
you sometimes get surprises when you have, you know, like data that's not accessible and readable. And, you know, again, like you're saying, public cloud, deep archive, um, where you're not touching it, it's just a disaster recovery um, or long-term, you know, preservation, uh, you know, play, then, yeah. you know, it's operationally and, you know, um, kind of data integrity wise, it's, it's makes a lot of sense. Yeah, absolutely. So maybe we can kind of summarize uh, what we've kind of gone through today. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, looking back to our kind of previous webinar, you know, um, about object storage as a storage technology, um, you know, kind of looked at all the different uh, kind of flexible deployment models, being a software defined uh, kind of storage platform, uh, you know, where you can utilize different hard drive capacities and even utilize, you know, a complement of flash disk um, for different use cases. Um, but having a central uh, sh standard uh, storage interface, the S3 API, um, allows this kind of, you know, private cloud, hybrid cloud, public cloud, you know, this flow of services and data, you know, um, across all these different domains. Um, and, you know, it's, as we're kind of looking at today, the cost effective nature of object storage is one of the key drivers, the scalability and the cost effective nature of, uh, of object storage. Um, yeah, and, and I, I really like to kind of add into that cost effective aspect here. If you are building a long term strategy, whether it be for one petabyte or 100 petabytes, you need to really be thinking about this. And I know that we think, oh, it's either public cloud or private cloud, but there are also kind of blurred solutions in the middle, um, taking something like this and putting it in either a colo or, or helping having a partner with it. But you really have to create that long-term vision so that you can get your economics in order. Right. And, you know, there's, you know, again, as people kind of transition to, uh, you know, kind of look at their, you know, at this transition point for their kind of uh, digital infrastructure. Um, you know, they're kind of surveying all these different technologies, all these different storage as a service. Um, and, you know, there's not, not, you know, there's not one right fit for everyone. Um, so everybody has to kind of really look at, if you are more of a service provider um, that you don't own the content and you, you know, you don't monetize it. You're not keep. You're only keeping it long term for contractual purposes. Um, you know, there's certainly benefits to, you know, deep archive or tape archive. Um, but for any kind of constant access patterns, or you know, you're actually utilizing this on yeah. a on a regular basis, um, then you know, on-prem object storage certainly, you know, you can easy to make the case that it's a lower to total cost of ownership. Than public cloud services over those over longer terms, um, with fewer gotchas, you know about you know predicting how much it is actually going to cost you, um, and it, you know if it's if you know different tape archives, you know you can kind of trim uh, you know budgets here and there to really kind of trim the budget down, but you cannot get away from you know the operational overhead that managing a tape library uh, represents. So. Cool. Um, so, well, thank you so ahead. much, David, for this wonderful talk today. Um, if you really want to dig into this a little bit more, please reach out to me or David. Um, uh, I think that we have a little bit of time for some questions if we have anything. Uh, our first question is Have you had any customers that transition from public to private cloud? Uh, me um, at Western Digital, we saw this trend um, evolving because of exactly what you pointed out before is they didn't completely have the calculations down and it kind of burned them. They had to step back and look at exactly what was important and what wasn't and, and how do I balance this new hybrid world because hybrid really is the right way to go from everything I have seen. I don't know about you, Dave. What did you see? Yeah, I mean, you know, the there's even kind of a rich, uh, a term that's come out of this phenomenon. It's called repatriation, right? So it's like, you know, you have an organization adopts from a 
top down, you know, directive to have a cloud first strategy. Um, so we're going to put everything in the cloud. Um, I think what a lot of that top down strategy doesn't take into account is that at the ground level, data, especially media assets and in, in the messiness of content creation and uh, distribution uh, at the ground level, it's, it's a little bit not so tidy and a little bit messier. There's duplicate files, there's, you know, orphan files, people, you know, I don't know what that is, but we can't delete it because I'm not sure who, who you know, what, if it's important or not. <laughs> and so that kind of lack of like real, you know, every organization has a certain, you know, lack of, uh, visibility and in, in, in structure into their data. And when you just yeah. lift and shift that into the cloud, it's like, now you're paying for that lack of, uh, so you moved your messy garage just right up yeah. there to the cloud, right? And, right. Uh, <laughs> so we, exactly. <laughs> so we had a customer that you know they, you know, as an organization, they put nine petabytes up in the in the public cloud, and then they all of a sudden they realized it's like, wait a minute, like I can't play back. I did, I'm looking for a video file and I can't play back the video file. I have to download it to see what it is. No, that's not the right one. I'm going to download another one. So they, not only from an operational standpoint, but it's like, wait a minute, this is actually costing a lot to access every time. If we don't, if we don't have a really like through designed, uh, you know, cloud implementation, then, um, then you run admit, into, you're, make yourself vulnerable. I had the exact same problem. I was working on a, our last short film, Wonder Buffalo, and one of the partners who was involved wanted to show the work they had done, but they wanted a specific clip and we didn't know, we didn't tag it properly. And so we would have had to pull the whole file out of Glacier in a window right. of less than six hours. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was, a, it, was, it was a little bit challenging on that one. So, um, but that, that, that's really important stuff. And actually that kind of um, addresses what our next talk is gonna be about. We're gonna be talking with uh, TC of DNA Fabric um, uh, me, David, and TC, and we're going to be looking at how do you understand a little bit more of what you got across all of these environments so you can maximize not only your TCO, but your understanding of your data. Yeah, I think it's a really important topic, and I'm really looking forward to that. Yeah, that concept of mobility and visibility, which is absolutely key. Thank you again. Thank you, David and Eric. And uh, we'll be uh, on our next one in about two weeks. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.